Hello and welcome to St. Andrews, where we are a community of faith united by the love of Jesus Christ, building disciples through worship, study, prayer, and service. Just one announcement this morning that beginning next week, I will be on a three-month sabbatical, and there will not be a virtual service available while I am away. We will still have our in-person services with Reverend Bob Lee, who will be taking my place while I am away. Let us turn our hearts and minds to worshiping God. Let us pray. Come, Holy Spirit, speak to us in our own language about God's mighty works. Give us power to proclaim the coming of a new creation through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our first scripture reading today is from the Gospel according to Matthew. It's the end of the Gospel, chapter 28, verses 16 through 20. Listen for God's word. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember... I am with you always to the end of the age. And then we turn to the gospel according to John. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. A second time he said to him, son of, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter felt hurt because he said to him the third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you used to fasten your own belt and to go wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands, and someone else will fasten a belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go. He said this to indicate the kind of death by which he would glorify God. After this, he said to him, Follow me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So back in February, I asked everyone uh, to submit questions for an Ask Emily Sunday. And there were so many great questions and I've enjoyed addressing them um, in sermons, Monday meditations, and newsletter articles. But there was one question that I waited on. It was a question for today. And the question said, talk about your personal belief on the future of mainstream churches in America. Now, Main Street churches in America um, tend to be part of larger denominations that don't use the labels of charismatic, fundamentalist, or evangelical as their main identifier. So, mainstream or mainline denominations are, for example, Lutherans, uh, United Methodists, Episcopalians, American Baptists, Presbyterians, Moravians, and there's a whole uh, slew of other ones. These are kind of your stereotypical tall steeple churches. They tend to place an emphasis on scholarship, both religious and secular, and they tended to be active in the civil rights movement and other social justice causes. Now, since the 1960s, all mainline churches have been experiencing, experiencing a decline in membership, and the Presbyterian Church is no exception. Now, as options for other activities have increased and the social pressure to participate in religion has decreased, many choose to do something else on Sunday mornings or look elsewhere for social and service opportunities. So from a raw numbers perspective, the mainline churches are fading away. Now, I, I could quote some statistics here, but really it just paints a very bleak picture. So is there no hope? 
Our mainline uh, denominations doomed to a diminishing existence, fading into the annals of history. Honestly, maybe. If churches pretend as though there is no change in the life and movement of the spirit in the world since the 1960s, the 1560s, or the 660s, then there is no hope for the church. If the height of denominational life is held to be when the Sunday school wing was filled at 10 a.m. on Sunday morning with baby boomers when they were still babies, then there is no hope. If the whole purpose of the church is to sustain the church, then there is no hope. But, you knew there was going to be a but, I am not without hope. I am not without hope for God's work to continue because I continue to see the Holy Spirit at work animating God's people. The hope I see for Christianity as a whole and for mainline denominations in particular is in Christ revealed and alive. So in the passage that we read from the Gospel according to John, it's after Jesus' death and resurrection. The disciples have seen the risen Christ a couple of times. And here he is again, and he meets them on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, the place where he first called his disciples. So Peter is back at his old job of fishing when Jesus appears on the shore with breakfast waiting. Now the last words that Peter spoke directly to Jesus were that he would never deny him. The last words that Peter spoke about Jesus were that he did not know the man. So here on the shore is the first opportunity that Jesus and Peter have had to speak since those words were spoken. Now Jesus doesn't say, I told you so. Nor does he come at Peter with words of blame or accusations about how Peter denied him. Instead, Jesus talks to Peter about love. Three times he asks Peter to assert his love for Jesus. Three times Jesus gives Peter a mission and a purpose. Feed my lambs, tend my sheep, feed my sheep. Jesus is entrusting to Peter, the one who had really failed him in the moment of need. Jesus is entrusting him with continuing Jesus' mission. Now, in what we read in Matthew's Gospel today, Jesus gives to the disciples the Great Commission. It is a co-mission. It is a mission shared between God and the people of God. This is the future of the church. It is entrusted not to the perfect, not to those who stood up for Jesus at his trial because that was no one. It is entrusted to human beings. Human beings with all our faults, shortcomings, and sins are entrusted to be co-missioners with Christ. Now Jesus told Peter that there would come a time when his co-mission would leave him to a place that he did not want to go. A difficult place to go. A place where all seems bleak and the downward trend of the world feels so oppressive. But that is not where Jesus leaves the conversation with Peter. He tells them that, that feeding and tending his sheep will not be an easy task. And after laying it out all before Peter, this one who had denied him, Jesus calls him again, using those same words that he said to him on the Sea of Galilee so long ago. Follow me. And Peter does. Peter and the other disciples, they go stumbling forward into the future, seeking to fulfill the co-mission that they have with Christ. The gospel proclamation, this command to baptize and teach, they go stumbling into the future. Sometimes they trip and fall flat on their face, but the co-mission still stands. So my hope for the church, in all its many forms, is, my, is the same as my hope for St. Andrew's in particular. And that's that we will continue to move forward, still seeking to fulfill the co-mission we have from Christ. For St. Andrew's, my hope 
is that we will continue to live into our mission statement where we seek to build disciples through worship, study, prayer, and service, even if that looks different than it did when the cornerstone of our sanctuary building was laid. Soon in our service, we will welcome new members to our church. And I know that many of you may, might look upon the youth of some of our new members and say, this is the future of the church. But I want to speak directly to the youth. You can feel free to listen, to, listen in. Your purpose and the commitments that you make today as you join the church are not to secure the future of the church. You don't have to save the church. Jesus has taken care of saving us all. Your purpose is not to be the future of the church. Your purpose and the commitments you make today are to be the present of the church. Now, I mean that three ways. First, I mean present as in gift, because God has given each of you gifts. We talked a little bit about those gifts in confirmation class. You each have active minds and great ideas. You have presence that you can use for this congregation. Now, the second meaning of present means that you have to be present. You have to be here to use them. Sometimes we come to church and it's just our body that makes it through the doors. Our mind is elsewhere. Don't worry, adults do this sometimes too. But you are to be present and engaged with your whole self in this church. If you have ideas, share them. Be present. Challenge and join in. The third day, the third third way that I mean that you are the present of the church, I'm talking about time. You are the right now of what God is up to in this church. And so is everyone else that you see engaged in worship with you. This is the church right here, right now. You don't have to wait around until you're all grown up to be about the mission of the church. And for those of you who are older, you too are the present of the church. So is there hope for mainline denominations in America? Maybe. Is there hope? that God is still at work here and now, take a look at what is going on around you. You are the present of the church. Jesus asked Peter after all that they had been through, Jesus asked him again, follow me, follow me. And Jesus still calls to us, follow me. As we seek to answer that call, to fulfill that co-mission, there is hope. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us pray. Holy One, you are the spark of life, for creation was envisioned by you and is sustained by you. And so, in gratitude, we pray for the world, that its riches and resources will be used responsibly and fairly, that its rulers and leaders may govern with justice, compassion, and humility, that humankind may live with understanding and respect, noticing what ties us together. Holy One, you lived among us to teach us, to show us how to love. And in humility, we pray for our siblings around the globe. For those dehumanized by their struggle for existence, may we listen. For those overshadowed by the con constancy of death, may we notice. For those besieged by fear, anger, and relentless peril, may we show up. For those ensnared by systems beyond their control, may we demand change. Holy One, you are here in this very moment as constant presence and insistent voice. And so, in gratitude, we pray that you would inundate the world with humanity, over, overwhelm the world with truth, flood the world with kindness, upset our indifference, accelerate our action, fortify, fortify our resolve, and compel us to authentic discipleship. Discipleship that nurtures creation, that embodies love, 
that breathes life, that joins in you, in with you, in the commission that we have. In your love and mercy, Lord, hear our prayer. Amen. Go to celebrate all that God has done as Christ breathes new life into you, sending you out into the spirit, with the Spirit into the world. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord be kind and gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen.